Hi, I'm Michael Clark, and welcome to the road trip. Today, in the Blue Ocean Studio, we've got the 2013 Honda Accord. And the one thing that we don't expect to see when it comes to anything mid-sized is anything involving a third pedal. And that's where I think Honda is very unique as a lot of other manufacturers have said goodbye to manual offerings, Honda continues. And while it is a carryover from previous generations of Accord, it's nice to know that Honda wants to give us some driving pleasure, even if it is in a very well-fed front-wheel drive architecture. Now, Honda's had some trouble over the last few years, and I think we can all remember the debacle that happened when the Honda Civic was introduced, and a lot of people were asking, what exactly did you do to it? What exactly did you change? So there was that fear when the new Accord was coming out that it was going to be much more evolutionary than revolutionary. And to look at it from the sides, you probably think that that's the case but there's been an incredible amount of changes to the structure and some unique safety additions that really get the view for you as to what's going on around your vehicle. Now we're going to show you all of these exciting new features on the Honda Accord today on the road trip. But remember, if you've got questions, thoughts, or feelings about anything automotive, we're here to help. Send us an email at honkyourhorn at live.ca. And remember to listen to the road trip every Saturday from 10 till noon on CJOB 680 AM in Winnipeg. Now, even though the new Accord is dimensionally smaller than the outgoing generation, the one thing I like here is that by putting a V6 into a midsize front-wheel drive type of platform, we're able to actually see around the engine. We have the opportunity down the road to get servicing that's not necessarily going to be as expensive as some of the shoehorn varieties that we've seen on other makes. Now, the 3.5 liter V6 with this Accord V6 gives us 278 horsepower and 252 foot-pounds of torque. The thing I wanted to point out about this engine is the Earth Dreams technology. Now, we've heard more about it with the 2.4 liter four-cylinder because the 2.4 is the engine that now has direct injection. The V6 is still a multi-point injection type of system, but there has been Earth Dreams technology added to it. And when we talk about Earth Dreams, it's really more about how the engine is mapped, how it's going to be doing for efficiencies, and ultimately making sure that it's keeping emissions low. Now, the six-speed manual with this particular setup is one of our favorite shifters so far for this type of configuration. It's downright notchy. And the one thing I wanted to point out, if you have to compare it to something in the Honda camp, and if you had the pleasure of driving a Honda S2000, that's exactly what we're talking about here. This is a shifter that is put together in such a way that you definitely don't want to manhandle it. You've got to drive this manual transmission properly. So don't expect the rubber bandy type of feel of other lesser makes. This thing is a notch fest. The one thing I wanted to point out too is that the suspension that we normally get with a Honda Accord, we automatically think of the front double wishbones. Well, we're going to have to put that into the museum because they've now gone to max struts up front. Now, the max strut setup is actually lighter, and as the whole Earth Dreams philosophy continues to flow, that means that we've got better efficiencies all around. The cradle has also been redesigned, and it's a combination of aluminum and steel. There's actually quite a bit of high-strength steel going on in this next generation of Accord. In fact, it's almost 56%. That contributes to some of the best crash test marks that we've seen so far. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety has rated the Accord as a top safety pick plus. Now, why that's important is how they do that crash test. Because in the past, the 
test to get the best marks on. When it came to frontal from the Insurance Institute was the moderate overlap. But now what they've done is they've realized that some of the most horrific crash events are going to happen with the small overlap. So consider about 25% of this front portion impacting something like a pole crossing over and hitting another approaching vehicle. So Top Safety Pick Plus gives us that as well as the best ratings for the roof crush test. So put it all together and you've got yourself a very safe package. But it's not just about the occupants. There's a lot going on here when it comes to mitigating pedestrian injuries. And we talked about hoods that have a lot more crushable space. Now we've got that going on with the Honda Accord, but it doesn't stop there. In fact, other areas that you see here, such as the wiper arms, behind the bumper covers, the hinges themselves, they've all been designed to deform when there is an impact from someone like us made of meat. Now, I wanted to point out one of the favorites when it comes to making a Honda handle. And while it may not be the boy racer look, it's great to see a strut tower brace here. That's going to tie everything in very nicely. Now we're dealing with electric power steering, but at no time has this particular vehicle felt video gamey. It is not the electro steering that you may expect from lesser cars. You're going to feel very hydraulic when it comes to positioning this vehicle through the corners. Now a growing trend amongst many manufacturers is the advancements in signature lighting. And obviously it has its safety attributes, Sometimes it seems as though the LED punch has been tacked on. But I like what they've done here with the brows on the Honda Accord's headlamp assemblies. Now, the EXL trim that we've got here is, of course, the top of the line. And that means that we've got the LED projector headlamps. That's right, LED. Not halogen projectors, not by xenon. LED projector headlamps that are using 50% less power than a comparable halogen unit. Now, they punch through the night exceptionally well. But the one thing I wanted to point out is that there's some more reasonable solutions that have come forth with the lighting on this Accord. Now, I like to have the exterior repeater lamps on the mirrors, and it's a good safety, sensible solution. But what I don't like is that they sometimes seem to look as though they came off of a trailer, and that we don't have here with the Honda Accord. They've gone with a very thin type of unit, but of course with the LED punch, they're very easy to see. The only place that didn't actually get the LED treatment when it comes to lamps on the Accord Coupe is the rear lamps, which are incandescent. There is LED tail lamps available on the sedans at the highest trim levels. The exterior mirrors on the Accord Coupe are a lot more interesting than just having the ability to move out of the way if somebody whacks it in the parking lot. Let's start with the driver's side mirror. It has the expanded view style of mirror that we first saw and enjoyed on the Honda CRV. The right hand side, well that's where it gets really interesting. Now take a look at the growth underneath the mirror. Now that is a camera and it's something that we first started to like on the Acura RDX concept a few years back in Detroit. Now that vehicle actually didn't have mirrors on the sides of the vehicle. It had rear-facing cameras and it would give you the view on the central display. Well, here we are in 2013 and we're just about there where we might be able to even think about eliminating the mirror. And let's explain why that's not so crazy of an idea. Because an exterior mirror on the right hand side is only going to give us 18 to 22 degrees of a field of view. Now, when you go to a camera system like this, that grows to 80 degrees. So think about the scenarios where that might be important, say on a three-lane highway, and wondering if somebody is going to be coming over from a lane that you simply can't see with this mirror pane. Now, 
The neat thing about the system is that it is working with your right hand signal. So when you put the signal on, what's going to happen is that the view is going to come up automatically. So not only do you have the obvious from the mirror itself, but you also have the central display showing you what's actually there beyond what the mirror can see. Now we had to ask ourselves, where else could something like this be advantageous? Let's say you're in a bad part of town and there's somebody approaching the vehicle that might be a little bit unsavory. Well, the neat thing about this camera view is that you can actually set it to the on position. So you can be in a parked position and seeing what's behind you and to the side, and you can be using it in traffic. But we don't recommend it. It is a little bit distracting. When you design an icon, it's daunting but exciting. Honda's first priority is where the people are, and then you build around that. The new Accord follows that philosophy completely. We call it man maximum, machine minimum. What that means for the customer is that it's a comfortable, open, airy experience that's easy to get in and out of. It's big on the inside and smaller on the outside for a really efficient package. The styling of the all-new 2013 Accord is definitely premium. It's sleek, it's elegant, sophisticated, and timeless. We stay true to the big greenhouse and the visibility, the narrow A-pillars, all these things that people understand. They, they look at that and say, wow, I, I can see everywhere. I can see 360 out of the car. That actually makes the styling much more pleasing because of the, the balance between the, the glass and the vinyl. For 2013, we up the ante even more. We add a level of luxuriousness and craftsmanship that we've never seen before. And Accord really delivers on that front. This 2013 Accord is the best we've ever done. Okay, this is never the fun part. I mean, really, it's never fun to get into the back of a two-door anything, unless you've got flip-out suicide-style doors, RX-8. But I don't want to do it. I, I really don't. I'm, I'm really trying to come up with reasons how I can just shoot around it, show you there's a back seat back there. But then I wouldn't really be testing it, would it? Now, that means taking my bad 44-year-old knees and actually going back there. And I think I probably wasted enough tape, so... I'm going in. Oh, this is going to hurt. Oh, even that hurt. Okay. Well, the seat's forward. That's a good thing. And it's important on any two-door vehicle that you've got the abilities to slide that seat forward. And on this particular Accord, what they've done is you simply take the recline lever, hold it up, and it shoots forward. That's nice. Now, the one thing that I noticed on the driver's side is that it has an easy type of lever to bring the seat back forward. Now, at first, I thought that meant that the driver's seat was going to be able to move the same way. That would have been a neat trick, considering that it's a power-actuated seat. So what that lever is actually there for is for the ways that we use a two-door vehicle, for putting your briefcase or your knapsack in the back seat easily. So it's a smart solution. I still got to get back here, so I think I got to stop talking about other things unless I can find some other features on the car before. I oh, it's got door pockets. Hey, great. Uh, you can put bottles in there. Um, uh, the door's got weather sealing around it. Uh, here we go. So 
So far, so good. Okay, my, my head's not hitting the ceiling. Good, good. Okay. My head's still not hitting the ceiling. Good. Uh, hey, there's actually a lot of room back here. And not only is there good room, but there actually feels as though some support has been put into the seat backs, which is interesting because this is a folding seat back. And as we mentioned, it, the entire seat back folds down. But that must be a good thing in respect to getting the comfort because there's nothing here that feels wrong, especially in the lumbar. So it's something that if you're going to be going on a trip with another couple, they're not going to be upset to be back here. Now, the only thing that I did notice just from the initial sit-down is that there's unique trays that have been put into the side panels. Now, they're not bottle holder or cup holder specific. They're more like stuff holder uh, types of trays. The only thing that's a bit of a drawback, though, is that there's no additional padding back here, so the side elbows are going to get a little raw. So I think they should think about putting that in on a future model. Now, there's seat back pockets for both the driver and the passenger front seat. The one thing I was kind of hoping for was maybe some power outlets, but I think we might be actually able to get some of that from the front. I'm going to check the console out and make sure. The one thing I like, too, is that the coat hooks, something that seems like a very easy thing to integrate into any interior, well, these ones have been put in in such a way that they sit flush until they're needed. So that makes things easy. Now, as I mentioned, the driver's side seat has the top flip that allows it to move forward so you can put items back here. What I also notice is that the passenger side footwell, the mat is held in actually very tight and it has a locking tab. So when you think about how many times people would be getting in and out of this back seat, what Honda is saying to you is that yes, you can get in and out of this seat and not be jamming the mats underneath the seat and making them non-usable. Well, I'd have to say, so far, for the space back here, exceptional. Now, the one thing that I did notice, too, is that the headrest design is such that when you need to position them for the rear passengers, easily done. There's a center shingle. But the one thing I did want to point out about this vehicle is that as much as they tout it as a five-seater, the way that they've sculpted the seats here, you're not going to really enjoy sitting in the middle. But I have noticed already in driving it that the headrests do get out of the way quite well when it comes to rearward vision. Now, we got back here okay. I just wonder if I can get out. When you first see it, Electrovair looks like any other car, but when you get into it, 500 volts replaces the fuel tank and an electric motor takes the place of an engine. Forward or reverse is selected with a standard gear shift lever. The smoothest possible acceleration is provided by the solid state controls. Electrovair 2 can accelerate as quickly as a standard Corvair, even with a full load of passengers. Once underway, Electrovair 2 gives a new sensation in driving. There is no engine noise or vibration. All you hear is the hum of electricity pulsing through the controls. The car handles normally in every way except for braking. There is no engine drag to help slow down Electrovair 2. Therefore, higher performance brakes are used. Additional electronic controls could be added to give dynamic braking. The solid state controls for Electrovair 2 are behind the rear seat. You can see the heavy cables used to handle the high currents required. Electrovair 2 was built as a test bed for motor and control development. Road tests of the complete car are the only way to find out whether a motor control system will work under everyday driving conditions. Typical traffic driving requires starting, stopping, following, passing. 
all with smooth, positive control of power. As we press the accelerator, our controls must accurately supply extremely high currents to the motor, as much as 500 amps, to quickly and safely pass other vehicles. Electrovair 2 can only travel 40 to 80 miles, depending on how you drive it, before its silver zinc batteries must be recharged. Recharging takes almost six hours. Obviously, for most driving, a better battery must be found to make a practical car. But Electrovair 2 has demonstrated for the first time what electric car performance could be like when that better power source is found. The EXL level is going to give us the expected features such as navigation. Now, the navigation screen is one of the larger in the industry right now. Extremely crisp, easy to read. And the one thing I really appreciate is how the Honda navigation screens have evolved. The text doesn't look like it came from a dot matrix program, for example. The audio controls have been laid out in such a way that anything that you want to do from setting your presets to the sound settings is all done with the touch screen directly below the navigation screen. There's actually very little when it comes to any form of switchery for the audio controls other than the power, the eject for the CD, and the volume control. Directly below that is the HVAC system. Now there's dual climate zone, so the driver can set to their specific temperature as well as the passenger. And it's crisp. It's easy to read. It may not be the most advanced when it comes to displays, but you're not going to have any problems figuring out exactly what you've set it up as. Important to note that the dual climate zone system has the sync capability. It's amazing how many more expensive vehicles don't give you that for your HVAC system. The rear defrost and the exterior heated mirrors, well, they're all controlled by the same switch. So make sure, even if there isn't any frost on the rear window, that you hit that on the way in to ensure that you've got clear vision down the sides of the vehicle. Below the HVAC controls is the intuitive control, as I like to call it, that has been used on Hondas for quite a few years. What I've found with this setup is that moving it down to this position seems to work a little bit better from some of the different positions that Honda has tried over the years. You can get into things such as your navigation, your phone, and related information to the vehicle. The phone settings have been set up in such a way that you can actually receive text and email messages and have them read to you. But you can also work with canned messages to be able to send while you're driving. Overhead, there's a sunglasses holder, an integrated home link transmitter, and an automatically dimming interior rearview mirror. The power moonroof is standard equipment on all Accord Coupe trims. Both visors possess illuminated vanity mirrors and can be slid into position for additional sun blocking as required. Smart vent side airbags reduce the possibility of injuries when the side airbags deploy. There's an added advantage for the winter months. That now means that the passenger side seat up front now has heat up the back as opposed to just the bottom cushion on the previous generation. The glove box still has plenty of room even with the War and Peace owner's manual supplements. There's also a lockout for the rear trunk lid in relation to the key fob. This is in addition to the keyed lockout on the floor. The Econ switch is something we've been seeing on a lot of different Honda products. And how it modifies the behavior of the Honda Accord V6 Coupe is unique. It actually takes the throttle inputs and makes them not as on-off as it could be when you're driving in more spirited modes. The climate control 
is adjusted accordingly. So things like fan speed as well as the draw on the AC compressor can be modified as required to give you the best possible economy factors. We weren't too surprised to see the addition of such features as lane departure warning and the front collision warnings which operate off of the front camera system. If you've been a fan of cars like the Honda S2000, you'll appreciate the red engine start-stop switch. Now, the switches for the steering wheel controls, they've been integrated far better than previous generation products. Most notably, the Bluetooth controls don't have that stick-on pod feel of previous cars. There's access to the information screens that are in the center of the speedometer display. Now I wanted to wrap up the look at the 2013 Honda Accord Coupe with some numbers and those are the efficiency numbers. Now when you have the V6 with the six-speed manual, the natural resources numbers peg it at 9.5 liters per 100 kilometers combined city highway. When you go to the V6 automatic, that goes to 8.2. A big part of that is the advanced variable cylinder management that occurs, but only on the automatic transmission cars. You can get four cylinders in the coupe, which would be the 2.4 liter Earth Dreams mill. And for most people, sitting at around 181 foot-pounds of torque is probably all they're going to require. But there's a different transmission solution for the four cylinders on Accords when you go automatic. It's now CVT. You can still get that six-speed manual, though, and it's definitely enough power to still have a lot of fun with it. Now, the awards for the Accord, well, they'd be all littered around our feet if we went through the last few years and generations. And one of the most important ones to now be bestowed is from ALG. And for 2013, they project that this mid-size car is going to have one of the best values in the next four years. As for whether or not it's going to stand the test of time as some accords of old, well, remember that the majority of everything that we've known as Accord has been a North American built product for many years. So the quality, the Acura-esque, if you will, of what is occurring here within and on the exterior of the Accord, you really wouldn't be able to tell the difference between something that came from the land of the rising sun. Now, if you've got thoughts, feelings, or questions about anything automotive, send an email to honkyourhorn at live.ca. We'd love to hear from you. And remember to listen to The Road Trip every Saturday from 10 till noon on 680 CJOB in Winnipeg. You can listen online at cjob.com, even download the podcasts from past episodes. I'm Michael Clark. Keep the shiny side up and the rubber side down.